Look at the stuff in the air. Look at that. Yeah. I wonder what that is. I don't know. Structures will not survive this tornado. You need to be below ground with. Hey, hey folks, this is deadly, deadly serious. Take the tornado precautions. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. Today we are covering a very highly requested tornado and it is the prolific 1999 Moore F5 tornado. Before we jump right into the video today, although I normally will have a viewer discretion advisory at the beginning of all my videos, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an extra heads up because today we're going to be not only talking a little bit more in depth about the fatalities and injuries associated with this event, but we are going to be seeing more graphic imagery than I'm typically willing to post on this channel. And the reason being is not to ogle at anything or be shocked. What I want to do today is have a discussion about tornado shelter safety, more specifically why it's not okay to shelter under an overpass during a tornado and the more 1999 F5 is a perfect opportunity to do so. With that being said, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's just get right into it. Moore, Oklahoma was originally founded in 1889 and was a very tiny community for nearly 100 years before becoming a full-fledged city in 1961 as industrial development began and the population rapidly grew from around 1,200 in the 1960s to just over 18,000 10 years later in 1970. So a lot of big growth happening. By 1999, Moore is a decently sized suburb of Oklahoma City with a population just over 40,000. Moore, Oklahoma is located between Oklahoma City and Norman and of course is in the heart of Tornado Alley. It is often set out from Oklahoma City. It's in the middle of America, in the Great Plains, halfway between the East and West Coasts. And this part of the Midwest is known as Tornado Alley, because of the special set of weather conditions that occur when warm air from the Caribbean moving northwards is pushed up by cold air coming down from the north. The clouds that form can stretch up to 40,000 feet or more. Up there, something else is going on, the jet stream. This fast-moving air blows the top of the storm into an anvil shape, and if the winds are right, the whole storm starts to rotate. This type of storm is called a supercell, and it's at the bottom of these that the really big tornadoes form. Plains may be known for their outbreaks, but more Oklahoma is synonymous with violent tornadoes. We know that people who live in the plains and Oklahomans are more than familiar with tornado outbreaks. So we also know that it takes more than a generic tornado setup to get these people concerned. And frankly, for this outbreak, we initially don't have that level of concern. This setup in particular is really interesting because while it is conventional in the sense that all of the larger scale parameters were there for a tornado outbreak, there was very little to no anticipation going into this event and honestly not that much discussion happening around it either. We will get more into this later, but for now, here's our main parameters. In the days leading up to May 3rd, 1999, and what would eventually become the strongest tornado ever recorded, we start off with a broad negatively tilted trough moving from the western half of the United States into the plains. We know that low pressure systems are conducive to severe weather already because they have winds blowing into them and the air is relatively thin, which means it can easily move up around other air masses making the atmosphere more unstable. With that system of low pressure, we also have decently strong winds in the mid to upper atmosphere as well. 
Because it's now approaching summer months, we also have our ample heat and moisture moving from the Gulf of Mexico being pushed into the Great Plains as well. This helps make the atmosphere juicy just as these storms like it. The last thing we have to introduce is a dry line that's going to be set to move into the Plains and the Oklahoma region on May 3rd as well. And this will provide the lifting mechanism for the storms. So now we have our wind shear, our instability, our moisture, and our lift. It's a perfect setup for tornadoes. So at this point leading into the event, although forecasters are seeing these larger parameters come together for what could be a tornado outbreak, they're not convinced that it's going to happen. And this is because there were those smaller mesoscale features that seemed to be limiting factors in what would be this tornado outbreak. Another huge problem with the forecast of this event was that the models that meteorologists rely on, the numerical models and model guidance, were giving the forecasters vastly different model runs and extremely high discrepancy about both where the storms would be and how severe they would be as well. So this, again, leaves them with a high degree of uncertainty. And if you know anything about the Storm Prediction Center, they are not going to issue higher risks for anticipated severe weather unless they are really confident and they just weren't confident on this event. So what they decide to do on May 2nd, the day before the event, is issue a slight risk, which is on the lower end of the scale, for a general area over the plains, which would include Oklahoma. It's now early in the morning on May 3rd, 1999. As always, the National Weather Service is issuing their weather balloons to collect data for morning forecasts, and the information they get back takes them by surprise. As early as 4 and 7 a.m., the data showed conditions much more intense than they originally had anticipated. Not only did the data show that the jet streak was much stronger than they thought, now around 90 knots, but the CAPE, the convective available potential energy in the atmosphere, was already at a staggering 3 to upwards of 4,000 joules per kilogram by 7 a.m. And you guys know that 4,000 is considered extreme by the National Weather Service. So those two smaller features were what the National Weather Service needed to be convinced that this would actually turn out to be a larger and more threatening outbreak. So now realizing this is much more favorable than they originally anticipated, the Storm Prediction Center reissues their convective outlook for the day at 11 a.m. and it includes a moderate risk for severe weather. But even still, this wouldn't be the last time they changed their forecast. Just before one o'clock in the afternoon, it's muggy, it's getting hot, and the clouds are clearing, which gives the sun more opportunity to create an unstable atmosphere. Winds are now really pushing into the area, and it's perfect tornado weather. As the afternoon approaches, temperatures push into the low 80s, above average for this spring day. Stewart senses something in the air. It was just hot. I kept telling Keith, you know, something was going to happen that day. National Weather Service again does another special weather balloon launch. And just before 4 o'clock, they decide to go back again, reissue the convective outlook at 4 o'clock, and it's now a high risk. So by this point, meteorologists and news networks have been seeing the increasing threat as the afternoon has been going on, and they're now working to prepare their viewing area for a potential outbreak of severe weather. Gary England is one of those meteorologists working to prepare his viewing area and issues what he calls a priority one to convey the gravity of the situation that he's seeing. So now in addition to going priority one, storm chasers and emergency personnel are being sent out around the city in anticipation of this event. Wise, but everybody calls it my hinky feeling. I called my boss and I said, I've got a really bad feeling about this one. I'm feeling hinky tonight. While all of this is happening, media is trying to prepare their viewing area for a potential outbreak. The storm that would produce the world's strongest tornado has already begun. Earlier in the afternoon, just after 3 p.m., a small supercell thunderstorm had formed in southwestern Oklahoma. It takes about an hour for the supercell thunderstorm to travel through the southwestern portions of Oklahoma before it eventually reaches the outskirts 
of the primed atmosphere and would very quickly begin feeding off of the cape that was ample in this area. Yeah, we have a situation uh, that's fairly dangerous, storms are in intensifying very rapidly, um, explosive thunderstorm development, and the possibility of some tornadoes with these storms. You have to be aware of the weather. Um, you have to watch it, especially if you're supervising an EMS system. Hey, Frank, it's Murph. As time goes on, you look at the cloud, the formations, and if you see the little puffs start blowing up, then you know that you could be in for a long night. All right, I appreciate it. Bye. Soon after, as the cell is continuing into this primed atmosphere, it would begin rotating enough to trigger its first tornado warning by 4.50 p.m. in Grady County near Cement, Oklahoma. Just a minute later, a small tornado roughly 25 yards in diameter touches down seven miles northeast of U.S. Route 62. Before we go further, I also do want to note that this supercell thunderstorm would produce a total of 14 tornadoes during this outbreak and during its lifetime. But for the sake of this video, of course, we're only going to be discussing the few leading up into the Moore tornado. Okay, I'm going to estimate th uh, four miles straight west of Surreal. It's, uh, like I say, the funnel is real small. I'd say the funnel might not be any wider than 100 yards, but uh, it's throwing lots of debris. It's very intense at the surface. Uh, the funnel at ground level is now growing. Uh, it looks like it's a little bit wider than it was a while ago. Oh, this is So the supercell has just produced a tornado near Cement, Oklahoma. It wastes no time in taking advantage of this atmosphere and immediately starts causing F3 intensity damage. And this supercell is really just starting to get cranked up. While this one specific tornado in cement would only last for a few miles before dissipating, it very quickly drops another tornado west of Chickasha, causing more F2 damage and would actually hit the Chickasha airport and not only cause a lot of damage but tear off the wing of an airplane that would later be found miles and miles away actually in more it's just that simple. Pick, pick a, uh, pick a crossover. Be very safe as you turn around. Do not, do not take any unnecessary risk. But we Again, this particular tornado doesn't last for too long. After causing damage at the airport, Again, this tornado dissipates. But these two tornadoes have been just a glimpse of what this supercell is really capable of. While the Chickasha tornado dissipates, this supercell is about to drop its ninth and most violent and deadly tornado. The Moore tornado. At 6.23 p.m., the tornado that would ultimately have the highest recorded wind speeds in history would touch down. It touches down just a few miles southwest of a town called Amber, and at this point, the atmosphere is at its most prime. The Cape has exploded, and it's just a perfect environment for a supercell to produce a wickedly powerful storm. This is headed now into the southwest metro area, beginning at Newcastle and Tuttle, and then potentially into southwest Oklahoma City. We recommend all forewarned crews that are in Just Oklahoma keep it City on, to keep it head into the southwest right parts of the yeah. metro. Now going to another large tornado, and I also want to make it here. I've got a big small size hail falling out of this as well. The tornado is moving at a northeast trajectory through Amber, and it would then cross over Highway 92. It's exactly at this point after crossing over the highway that many people report the tornado very quickly and eerily transforms from a very small tornado that's just touched the ground to now a massive three quarter mile wide tornado at F4 intensity just in those first few minutes. Over the next few minutes, it would absolutely destroy several homes in the area. At this point, the tornado clips a neighborhood east of the town of Amber, where several manufactured homes were waiting, and this would just absolutely shred those to pieces. Man, that is one nasty, nasty. 
Oh, Lord. Okay. John's got a cellar in the house. Uh, in the house? Yeah, yeah, he does. I've been in it, as a matter of fact. He showed it to me one day. But you can feel wind sucking that away. Look at that mm -hmm. tree heading that way. Yeah. The twister travels several miles while steadily increasing. It's been an F4 for a little while now and a massive wedge tornado with no signs of slowing. And while you can see how large the tornado is, even at this point on video, there's no way anyone could begin to fathom how strong this tornado was as it moves into its next target, Bridge Creek. And look at, the, look at how it's sucking it up in. Uh -huh. Well, it's getting still, and that's when it's bad. That's, that's... Listen to the roar. My look at Lord. the stuff in the air. Oh, look at the stuff. Yeah. Debris. Holy shit. Look at that. Yeah. I wonder what that is. watching we're in an emergency situation it is so large it's getting ready to move into very distant populated area as the twister is moving over the bridge creek area josh Worman and his vortex team are trying to get as close as they can within a safe distance from the tornado and collect as much scientific data as they can from the radar on the back into the cab of the truck where the computers are people is racing towards the biggest tornado desperate to get as close as possible they're scientists, and the leader of the group is Josh Werman. Um, so we should be getting very, very good dual Doppler on this right now. After two hours driving, they're starting to close in on their target. Look at the tornado. Man, that was visual. Man, that looks nice. I guess that's crossing the road now. Tracking the tornado for an hour and a half, they can calculate where it's heading next. Our forecast was that the storm would actually cross Interstate 44 and move towards Norman. The radar is picking up the wind speeds from this tornado near its peak, and the information collected that the team gets back shocks them. The tornado has just measured over 300 mile per hour winds. They are witnessing history. As the tornado passes over Bridge Creek, it's immediately apparent that the damage here would be some of the most intense, not only of this day, but some of the most intense damage that's ever been documented. After plowing through Bridge Creek, the tornado now barely has weakened to F4 intensity where it would continue on for several miles. It's still, of course, incredibly intense at this point and the tornado is rapidly approaching much more densely populated areas of the Oklahoma City Metro. Wedge-shaped tornado could be in the range of 200 to 250 miles an hour. Yeah, we've got just a huge multiple vortex tornado down here. It's right now about 45 miles out. So we got maybe 45 minutes. Okay, you're on Interstate 44, going to the southwest. Turn around. Don't mess with this thing. Don't bust. Now we've got a tornado right now close to the access road at H.E. Bailey Turnpike, north side of Newcastle. We've got baseball size hail in Newcastle right now. The tornado is still three quarters of a mile wide, so you can imagine just the massive swath that it's causing as it moves through these densely populated areas, destroying homes, businesses, anything that comes into its path. So at 6.57 p.m., meteorologist Dave Andra realizes that he's got to do something to convey the urgency here and that this is truly a life or death situation. He drafts up an alert and sends it out to the National Weather Service. It's the first ever tornado emergency. Things are also becoming increasingly tense because 
there is a lot of traffic on the roads right now, particularly on Interstate 35, which is now backed up because people are trying to shelter under the overpasses. This is unfortunately one of the parts where some of the most tragic stories occur. Just east of Bridge Creek and north of Newcastle, an overpass fatality would occur north of Interstate 44. Kevin Weber, Kathleen Walton, and her son Levi are all seeking shelter under the bridge's overpass as the storm approaches. The three of them go to the very top and hold on best as they can. Kevin Weber first recalls debris from the tornado as it's moving through the overpass of the bridge. Tiny pieces of debris piercing skin and causing cuts. Pretty soon after, a piece of a highway sign would come through the overpass and gash Kevin Weber's leg down to the bone. He then recalls the intensity of the winds pulling his body out from the overpass as he's holding on with his arms onto the ledge. He says that his body was flapping in the wind, slamming against the concrete on the side over and over like a waving flag. As the storm passes, Kathleen is holding on to her son Levi, and the intensity of the storm is too much, pulling them both. And Kathleen realizes that her and her son both can't hang on at the same time, so she tells him that she loves him and decides to let go. Kevin and Levi, the son, and two others who are sheltering under this overpass survive. This is like one of the hardest fatalities that I've read about. I mean, there were plenty of really awful ones, but this one is, you know, a lot harder. Let me get out his live coverage of uh, the uh, very severe uh, storm, uh, tornado. This does not look good. Uh, this looks like a man or a lady covered in mud. This uh, looks like their car. Uh, these people look to be injured from the tornado. Where were you guys? Underneath, underneath, underneath the underpass. Underneath. Were you really? Yeah. Wow. We you had guys to hang on both lucky. hands. Some little kid up there's mom. Yeah. 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 It's really unfortunate that they happened to be here and the intensity of the storm was so much over this one overpass. There's a picture of where the people were sheltering under this specific overpass where you can actually see the red clay mud that was being slung up against the bridge on the top. Oh man. Everything is leveled out here. The storm now heads northeast into the town of Bridge Creek, then on into the suburbs of Oklahoma City itself. Gary England is chief weatherman for Channel 9 TV in Oklahoma. Val, what do you have? Oh, it's large. It seems like a deadly tornado. Uh, most structures, most houses will not survive this, and it is moving toward Interstate 40. Uh, this is a storm that you need to be below ground level. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, the tornado continues into Newcastle, Oklahoma, causing extensive F4 damage, taking out hundreds and hundreds of homes, killing several people, injuring many others, and causing a massive swath of damage. It's almost a mile wide at this point and still at very high intensity.
So at this point, the tornado weakens a little bit to F2 intensity. It's also here where it's going over more open fields and where you will also see a satellite tornado that comes down from the side of this tornado. The brief period of weakening and the satellite tornado wouldn't last for very long as again it quickly recycles back into F3 and F4 intensity as it's moving towards more. It was only like a county and a half away. Operations is like a large area. And it was tracking right towards the metropolitan area. It just got bigger, more serious. Our first reaction was we're in trouble. This is not good. The tornado is now tracking straight for more. It's at F4 intensity and again meteorologists are watching this in horror realizing that there is nothing stopping this tornado as it is just recycled and is about to incur a lot more damage on a heavily populated area. As you look at this tornado, it's moving toward it. I, I still see, I see somebody driving down Interstate 44 to the north. That's control. Is that if you're driving up it. I tell you folks, I'd get the cellar right now. If you haven't already done it, don't mess with this thing. Don't go outside and look at it because it'll kill you. Oh, whoa. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Now, you folks, as you folks watch this, this thing now, as you watch this, keep in mind, whoa, oh, hey, many Christmas. Uh, many structures will not survive this tornado. You need to be below ground with this storm. This is a deadly tornado. The tornado, unfortunately, goes back to F5 intensity just as it enters Grady-McLean County line and into Moore. By this time, the tornado is now a full-fledged mile-wide wedge, and it's now rain-wrapped, drastically reducing the visibility of this storm and making it a lot more difficult for people on the ground to see what's happening. We, wow. see, we still see a huge, huge, huge tornado motion. Uh, Gary, uh, yes. we are a half a mile south of the tornado. We're getting wind gusts of 60 right now. For You're one half mile south? Half a mile south of the tornado, we're getting wind gusts of 60. Hey, folks, from Blanchard to southwest Oklahoma City. We have a series of pictures from Mark to the Dell City area. More. Right now, it may turn a little bit to the north of Norman. But right now, it's moving northeast, paralleling Interstate 44. Val, can you hear me? He may be outside. It's coming right up uh, alongside the turnpike. The circulation is about six miles across. Power, power flashes, power oh, flashes. man, oh, man, oh, man. Now, you folks, as you folks watch this, this thing now, as you watch this, keep in mind, whoa, oh, hey, many Christmas. Uh, okay. Okay. Gary, talk to me. Yes, so we're heading right into the, uh, the path of the thing on I-44, Gary. This would, of course, end up being another widespread area of intense and catastrophic damage. 11 people would be killed in this area and another 293 injuries as well. It's now 7.30 p.m. and the tornado is crossing through Moore. The first place heavily impacted in Moore would be the Country Place Estates subdivision, where 50 homes were destroyed and one home was completely slabbed, which is where the F5 intensity rating comes from. This is also the place where police would eventually find that plane wing that we talked about from the Chickasha Airport. It was over here all the way in Moore. Okay, now this thing is moving toward I-44. It's probably going to take in part of Blanchard, part of New... Get close to I-44. I'd say within a quarter of a mile or less. Okay, that's within about a where we... It left. looks like almost, almost skirting it. Almost uh, skirting it. Well, it, it, the direction it's going, it's going to be on I-44 for a while. Yeah, it looks like it's going right down I-44. Yeah, that's... You're watching a long track, very yeah. rare event. These uh, usually account for only about 2% of all tornadoes. They are deadly. You need, about need to be below ground level to survive. Another heavily impacted area would be around the Westmore High School. 
At the time, 400 adults and children were at the high school conducting an honor ceremony when the tornado would strike. Fortunately, the school did have reinforced walls in the auditorium, so they were able to take all 400 of the participants, put them safely in the auditorium, and although the high school did sustain a, a fair amount of damage, there would be no fatalities in this building. However, really tragically, police would find a dead horse outside of the high school in the parking lot, which is pretty disturbing. Another densely populated area hard hit was the East Lake Estates, killing another three people and pulverizing the homes in its path. Emerald Springs Apartments, there were another three fatalities when the two-story apartment building collapsed. The path is so wide and there's so many populated areas that are destroyed and damaged that I can't even get to all of them. We're just very briefly covering the main ones. I've seen lots of tornadoes. This thing is huge. Oh my gosh. Janeway Avenue was another incredibly hard hit area where there would be four people killed and many, many dozens of homes destroyed. And this is another area where someone will be killed under an overpass. We discussed earlier that Interstate 35 was being backed up because of the traffic and people hiding under the overpass with their cars. This again is an area that had a fatality. First heading south on Interstate 35, realize they are cut off by the mile wide twister. More than a dozen motorists hit the brakes at the Shields Boulevard overpass. And all the cars that were pulling up there were slamming into each other, rolling, and then people were jumping out. Me and Stuart started telling everybody, hold on to each other, hand, you know, head to toe. The horrified group lies on the sloping pavement with arms and legs locked together. A 26-year-old woman named Tram Bowie is running toward the overpass. She is steps ahead of her husband, who is carrying their two children, ages two and four. As the tornado swoops in, the father drops and covers the two children. They desperately hold onto the guardrail. But the young mother isn't so lucky. She is stopped in her tracks by the powerful winds. And it just looked like somebody hit rewind on her, except instead of going this way, she went straight up. And that's the last I saw of her. Just then, the full force of the twister bears down on the overpass. Winds are howling at up to 300 miles an hour. Oh my God! It's gonna hit us! Holy, it's gonna hit us! The winds are approaching 300 miles per hour, and underneath the overpass, it could accelerate even further. It's a very dangerous place to take shelter. The massive funnel is now less than half a mile from their death trap hideaway. There's also a really famous picture from this event of an overpass from some survivors. A man named Pat Carter, who was an Associated Press photographer at the time, and a woman, Tammy Holmgren, and her two daughters were sheltering under the overpass when the tornado is approaching and barely misses them by 250 yards. Pat is able to capture an incredible image and they were extremely lucky to have not been hit directly on. At this point, the tornado has weakened slightly to F3 intensity, still again causing an extreme amount of damage to many of the homes and buildings. Another two people would be killed here in a business as well. I tell you, this is deadly serious. We've been talking about it for an hour or two now. The damage is massive. Figure out uh, 
probably very near May. Crossing Southeast 44th Street into Dell City, the tornado moves through the highly populated areas of Dell Air Housing Edition, killing another six people and damaging or completely destroying hundreds of homes. Then it crosses 29th Street into Midwest City, destroying another building at a Boeing complex. And it's also at this point where the tornado moves across Interstate 40 and affects a large business district. Now, the tornado would destroy a lot of businesses in this area. Just one of those would be an auto group where over 800 vehicles would be completely destroyed or mangled or a total loss. Several buses were also picked up here and tossed upwards of two tenths of a mile. So again, just showing how violent it was. It did also consider an F5 rating at this point just because of the sheer amount of damage it caused to all these businesses, all the cars that were mangled and thrown around. It was really intense. To the Dell City area, more. Right now, it may turn a little bit to the north of Norman, but right now it's moving northeast, paralleling Interstate 44. Uh, this is a storm that you need to be below ground level. It is extremely dangerous. The damage was consistent with high-end F4 intensity winds, damaging several more homes at this point before very quickly starting to weaken, and by 7.48 p.m., the monster more tornado has finally dissipated. We'll tell you, that's the damage path parts of, across parts of Moore and southwest Oklahoma City. We think the wind speeds uh, with this was an F5, at least uh, 260 miles an hour, maybe strong. Is that person Bridge Creek there, Brady? And this would be Brad Waitman and uh, Derek Lett. This is just a little southwest of Oklahoma City. Wedge, stove, stove shaped. It started just north, just north of the Lawton area. Uh, produced multiple tornadoes. We really don't know how many yet. And at times this thing was an F2, sometimes F3, sometimes F4, sometimes F5. Uh, very dead. EMS crews and other rescue crews are very quickly starting to get into the heavily damaged areas. The people in neighborhoods that survived the tornado were coming out and trying to help their other neighbors because there were a lot of different injuries. Flowers head to Janeway in 27, yeah. one of the worst hit areas of the city. I don't believe this. I do not believe this is happening. Triage. Thank triage. Oh my well. God. One critical, 12 dead, wherever one unit is. The amount of injury and death in areas was so intense that there simply weren't enough personnel to cover it all, and the EMS who were working, the paramedics, all of the medical staff, the police officers, firefighters, they did an incredible job at triaging all of the patients, trying to get everyone the help that they needed. Oh, the next thing I know, they're just bringing bodies to us. Hang on, baby, hang on, honey. Breathe for me, honey. Yeah. Baby, you heard everywhere. Oh, You just your head. How's your chest? Oh. I'm gonna check the most important oh. things first, okay? Oh. He hurt up in his chest and it felt mushy, had some broken ribs. Oh. He was staying awake and he was hanging in there, but he needed to be seen before the one next to him did. Okay. Oh. Hey, Angel. Oh. Keep his head wrist. Oh. I got it. Oh. Yeah, there. Do you know your last name? Uh -oh. If someone doesn't know their own name, that's not good. She had injuries like you've never seen. I mean, it looked like somebody had just taken nails and driven them into her back. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what's happened? This is like a war. It's like somebody's dropped an atomic bomb. It becomes apparent very quickly that Bridge Creek and some of the other neighborhoods in Moore and Newcastle are 
are some of the areas with the most fatalities and injuries. The small town of Ridge Creek, 20 miles to the south, has been badly hit. They have no ambulance service of their own. Steve is sent to help. Right now we're going to uh, an area out in the country somewhere. We're just outside of our response area. And I'm not sure what kind of uh, situation we're responding to right now. Here's an empty guy. Oh, here. He's got a baby. Yeah, he's got a baby. All right, back up. He's got, he's got Mike and I started trying to get a grip on this thing. As we came up over this muddy hill, the parking lot was full of just demolished cars, dead horses, um, all kinds of debris. Just to the south of it, the neighborhood was completely leveled. There was not a single structure left upright. Steve Finley sets up in the gym in Bridge Creek, where local firemen are bringing the injured. He's the only paramedic there, and within minutes, he's swamped with patients. It looks like we got one critical and more coming in. I had no idea what we were in for when we got there. Once I got in the gym, from that point on, that's where I was. That was the only world that existed for me. I'm going to go to pediatric on you. Well, from this particular area, now what they're doing is they brought in heavy equipment. We're starting to dig through. We can't hear anybody moan. We can't hear anybody hollering. All we can hear is, is the silence and the wind blowing through the rubble. a 38-mile-long swath of destruction through Oklahoma City and surrounding towns. They might uh, could use your help at uh, First Baptist uh, Church in Moore, uh, especially uh, KB5 um, CEM kind of got drafted. And, um, Overnight, the American Red Cross opened up 10 shelters to house over 1,600 people that were immediately displaced. By the next morning, President Bill Clinton declares a major disaster for the area and signs for it to receive federal funding and aid. Throughout the next couple days, several post-disaster teams from FEMA were deployed to the region, which would include emergency response and preliminary damage assessment units. So you can see this is already a massive undertaking because the tornado went through such a heavily populated area. Medical and mortuary teams were also sent out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And by May 6th, donation centers and food banks were being established to create funds for the victims of this tornado. Over a thousand members of the National Guard would be deployed. A disaster recovery center also very soon after opened up as well. Even several days after the search and rescue process and going through homes, there were still several people missing, unfortunately, and that just shows you how intense and widespread the damage was, that there were thousands of people searching and trying to find, and still there were missing people. In fact, one of the women we talked about from the overpass who was sucked out wouldn't be found for a week.
in just a three and a half hour period, the Moore supercell would produce a total of 14 tornadoes. It would take a total of a 38 mile path through Moore, subsequently destroy 8,000 homes, over 1,000 apartments, 260 businesses, 11 public buildings, and seven churches that were all completely destroyed or majorly damaged. The kind of damage from this tornado, as I talked about a little bit before, reminds me a lot of Gerald, but somehow worse. I've seen a lot of different damage from a lot of different tornadoes, and this one is by far the worst. Not only are there completely slabbed homes like we've seen in Gerald, but the mangling of the cars, how they're crumpled around trees, it's beyond what I can really describe to you. And you'll see what I'm talking about in these photos. It's just absolutely horrific. The outbreak that occurred in Oklahoma City in early May was not the biggest outbreak of tornadoes ever, um, but it was one of the worst killers and one of the most damaging outbreaks, mainly because the tornadoes went through an urban area. If those tornadoes had gone through a relatively deserted area of West Kansas or the Texas Panhandle, they wouldn't have made big news. So now let's talk about the fatalities a little bit. On May 3rd, 36 people would lose their lives and another 583 would be injured. Five of those fatalities were indirect, most of them being people who had heart attacks during the storm. And unfortunately, one of them was a self-inflicted gunshot wound, a person who had just gone through the tornado saw that their home was completely destroyed and they were found after with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That is especially tragic as well. The Willow Lake and Southern Hills additions and Bridge Creek Estates were the highest fatalities as we've discussed, um, along with the highest number of injuries as well. Bridge Creek had 12 fatalities in just that one neighborhood, which was a lot. And of course, this is where those 300 mile per hour winds were as well. This also would make the Moore tornado the deadliest tornado since Terrible Tuesday in 1979. In just 21 hours between May 3rd and May 4th of 1999, over 74 tornadoes would touch down. Of course, one being an F5, there were two F4s and another eight F3s. So this was a full-on intense tornado outbreak on this day. This tornado would accrue over a billion dollars in damage, and that is in 1999 USD. This was the first tornado that ever accrued over a billion dollars in damage, and is still in like the top 10 for costliest tornadoes of all time. The rebuilding process began very shortly after the tornado. Just a few days later, seven cleanup teams and thousands of others, both in-state and out-of-state, come into Moore and other areas to help with the cleanup. Over 3,000 volunteers arrived in the area, and over 1,000 of them would be sent to the Bridge Creek area alone, which again just goes to show you how intense the damage was. The plans to rebuild Moore would incorporate a more tornado-friendly and safe city, which is a very good thing because moving forward, we know that more would experience an, two more violent tornadoes, an F4 from 2003, and of course the EF5 in 2013, our last EF5. The city embarks on a $12 million program to put storm shelters and build buildings back to be tornado safe. And by 2003, over 6,000 shelters would actually be built in the Oklahoma City metro area. Additionally, FEMA also gave out half a million dollars of a grant to help with outreach programs for victims to cope with trauma, PTSD from this event, and any other emotional distress or issues just a month later in June, it was estimated that 60% of the debris that was originally in the Moore areas had been cleaned up, which is really incredible. That's a lot.
So overall, there are so many reasons why this tornado is prolific, historic for a lot of reasons as well, and particularly tragic. Of course, this storm would have the strongest measured winds in recorded history, a huge revelation for the scientific community. The tornado would subsequently be studied for years and years after it happened. It's still being studied today. It was also the first time a tornado emergency was ever issued, which again was another big change in the meteorology community and one that stuck. In fact, this event is so integral to Oklahoma history that it's referred to again in other tornado coverage as being another May 3rd. As soon as people hear that, they know exactly what's being talked about. Now, another reason why this tornado is so interesting to talk about and has been studied so much is because of the fatalities in the overpasses. We've talked about this earlier, but the fatalities from the overpasses in this event were extremely tragic and 100% preventable as well. At the time in 1999, it wasn't common knowledge that overpasses were an extremely dangerous place to be. Even at some point in the documentary with the paramedics, you can hear one of the main paramedics telling his crews that if they get stuck out in the storm to get under the overpass. So it wasn't common knowledge even to like EMS. One of the things I'm going to show you is a presentation that the National Weather Service had made about this event specifically and the three fatalities that occurred from the overpass incidents. So it talks a lot about why specifically overpasses are really dangerous to shelter under, mainly because it essentially becomes a wind tunnel and debris is often shot through these wind tunnels and it just becomes like missiles essentially under the bridge. Again, to reiterate on this point and just talk about how dangerous this was, Brian Hansen, who worked for a media outlet at the time, this was from a different event, but similar circumstance. Brian Hansen was in traffic trying to get to work as a tornado is about to cross a busy intersection. However, he gets stuck in the traffic because again, people are trying to shelter under the overpass and pack their cars underneath. The storm crosses over and of the 12 people who are outside of their cars sheltering under the overpass directly, one of them would be killed, which is tragic in itself. But something that Brian Hansen talks about in this particular situation is that the kinds of injuries that were sustained were so horrific and he felt like people didn't talk about it enough. Some of these injuries include missing ears, missing noses, compound fractures, deep lacerations and gashes, crushed bones, just really horrific life-altering injuries that he feels weren't talked about enough. The way the media portrayed it was that it was a good thing that only one out of the 12 people passed away, but in all reality, the injuries sustained could have killed a lot of those people and were horrific injuries that mangled the people that were under that bridge. And one thing I actually wanna ask you guys to do is let me know, first of all, if you knew that overpasses were a dangerous place to be during tornadoes. If you knew that, one. And the second question is, if you knew that, where did you learn that from? Did you learn that from the Weather Channel? Did you learn it from watching tornado videos? Did like a parent tell you, or how did you know that it was a dangerous place? Or maybe on the opposite end of the spectrum, you didn't know that it was dangerous. And also let me know, I'd like to do a little experiment because I personally think that a lot of people still don't know that you can't shelter under an overpass. I still think a lot of people do that during storms. And so my goal here with talking about these horrific deaths, I know it's gruesome and sad, but my intention is to educate people, not just telling them that they can't, but showing them why. And I think it sticks a little bit better when you have a sort of cautionary tale to go with it. This one was a really tough one, guys. It was super emotional. Um, it's pretty graphic compared to some of the other ones I do. And it was just tougher to talk about. Again, my goal here is to just help people understand tornado safety a little bit better. I'm also going to be linking, as always, the FEMA and ready.gov guidelines for tornado precautions. If you don't have your tornado safety plan, I'm linking those down below. Please go check them out. Please think about what you would do during a tornado. They happen in a lot of different places in the United States. So just be prepared. Think about what you would do. That is all I have for today, guys. 
I am a little emotionally drained after this one. It, it, it is a really heavy and tough one, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I hope you got something out of it. Please let me know what you think down in the comments below. You can also go follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up with what I do on a more daily basis. And yeah, I think that's it, guys. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!